blessed with so many incredible educators, artists, activists, everything in between and beyond here at the Beacon Stage. So first, I want to acknowledge you for being here, for saying, yes, you could be doing anything else in this, I mean, you literally could do anything right now, but you chose to be here with us. So can you make some noise for yourself? And also, it's Mother's Day! So can you make some noise for your mama? Your mama's mama? Yeah! Hey! Your mama's mama's mama? Woo! I'm like channeling Andre 3000 now. <laughs> Same as mama's mama. So we're in for a true gift. Y'all, how? No, make sure I ask this. How many of us have ever had a psychedelic experience? Make some noise! Woo! their thoughts on how psychedelics not just be used as a tool for personal development, but as a tool for regeneration, for reparations, and there was one more arm, I'm so sorry y'all, and restoration y'all, right, let's pick up the energy, give it up for Roman and Ismael. Mamas, Pachamama, 
sisters and brothers with prayers in their hearts. So this song was taught to me by a client of mine who, before I came here, I'm from DC, and before I uh, made it to Lightning in a Bottle, first of all, thank you, Ismael, thank you, Maps, for, for hosting me here. Thank you, Beacon Stage and the Compass folks. I was in St. Louis. I was in um, St. Louis working on a civil rights case where um, a young man about my age was left to die on the floor of a rural county jail. He had severe diabetes and they wouldn't allow him to take his medicine because he was faking. And so he went into glucose shock and a blood sugar reading of about 2,500. If you know anything, that's like, that, that's a miracle in and of itself. It's basically biologically impossible to have a blood sugar that high and still be alive, but he was still alive. And then he passed away. And I was with my clients. We were, we spent the day deposing, which means taking the testimony of the nine jailers who were responsible for this. And I have to tell you, that's not normally a very happy, <laughs> occasion. But because of my relationship with this woman, this was her younger brother who passed away, she not only got up the courage to participate in this process by sitting across the room from these white jailers who had killed her brother, but she, she, she brought her family with her, her other younger siblings, she's a leader, and they sat there with pride and with dignity perhaps for the first time since this happened, which was four years ago, which tells you something about why we need to reform our legal system. <laughs> four years ago when we were still taking testimony. Anyway, as we digested and integrated this experience, which fundamentally was an experience of dignity for her, she taught me this song. And I'm gonna, and I, I, I then recorded it and sang it for my mom, and I'd like to share it with all of you. So here it goes. La 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 la. Somebody they prayed for me, had me on their mind, took a little time and prayed for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. Oh, I'm so glad they prayed for me. My mama, she prayed for me. Had me on her mind. <coughs> Took a little time and prayed for me. You're next, you're next. I'm so glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed. Oh, I'm so glad she prayed for me. Pat your mama. Pacha Mama, she prayed for me, had me on her mind, took a little time and prayed for me. Can't hear you. I'm so glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed. Oh, I'm so glad she prayed for me. Thank you. Thank you, Romani. So before we start going into all the words, I'm just gonna have a little bit of time to ground and have a couple questions to ask you. So if you could do me a favor and close your eyes and get comfortable, maybe put your feet or your hands on the ground, just settle into your body, settle into yourself. We're at liberation in a bottle. Doing the damn thing Sunday afternoon. Thank you for making it this far. And as you settle into yourself and maybe check in with your body, your mind, or your relative dopamine and serotonin levels, just take a moment to appreciate what got you here. family, your friends. I asked this at the Psychedelics Day of the Union on Thursday, but for how many people here is it your first festival? Hell yeah. 
welcome. You're in it now. You've been initiated. LAB is the real deal. So take a moment to just sit with where you came from, who you came from. And maybe, maybe you think a little bit about your origin story. What is your origin story? Interpret that however you wish. What was the first step to get you here? What kind of trials and successes and celebrations and tribulations have you gone through to get here? Take a moment to appreciate that, to honor that. And as you kind of start to crystallize that story in your heart and in your mind, maybe expand it a bit. Maybe expand it a bit and start thinking a little bit about your liberation story. Maybe your origin story and your liberation story are the same one. Maybe you've gone through phases like the moon, sometimes deep in the dark, sometimes obscured by the sun, sometimes obscuring others. And just take a moment to think about what transformations, transmutations, transfigurations you've gone through. Maybe it's happened in the last three days. Maybe it happened last night. Maybe it's still happening right at this exact moment. So I want to start by having the three of us share a little bit about our origin stories and our liberation stories, just to give you all a sense of who we are and what we're doing here and why we're talking about this topic, psychedelics for restoration, reparations, and regeneration. Those are three very big words with some really deep, really heavy, really complex meanings. Four, really, if you include the word psychedelics in there. So these are big topics, and as Roman said, to set the stage, we want to give you an idea of who we are, where we're coming from, why we think it's important to be talking about this in the first place, and then we'll get a little bit more into the specifics. I'll just say that this is the third of three talks from, that are being put together by the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. So thank you for being here. We've been building an arc over the course of this weekend. We're really excited to close the loop with you all. So, origin stories, transformation stories. Do you want to start? I'm happy to start. Um, but I already spoke, so I feel like you should start. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Paula. Um, my mother uh, was born in uh, Guatemala, in the capital. Uh, her parents are from Quetzaltenango. Uh, I've been the first, uh, I'm the first in my lineage to identify as Guatemalan and recognizing that um, I am a product of the colonial encounter that happened in the 1500s in Guatemala. And um, on my dad's side, I'm German Jewish and um, my family fled the Holocaust in Germany during the rise of the Third Reich and went to Chile and that's where my father was born and then they had to leave Chile again because uh, it was politically destabilized and my parents went in LA and they fell in love and um, here I am um, and they're both chronically ill or no longer in this realm so something that my origin story keeps me accountable to is how psychedelics play a pivotal role in addressing collective intergenerational trauma given uh, forced migration, political destabilization, and genocide, massive genocide. Paula, 
Sorry for going on, would you be open to talking about your early LIB experiences? My earlier LIB experiences? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, I started raving at age 14, um, and that's when I began. I, I began self medicating at age 14, and um, I felt very empowered by self medicating. It felt very intuitive, and um, by age Page 17, I attended my first LIB, and that was a really important experience uh, because it, I had already at that point realized I was not free on the dance floor because I would see some of the toxicity that I experienced in the default world uh, regurgitated on the dance floor and in my festival experiences. So part of my origin story is really uh, noticing how identity politics and history plays out on the dance floor and at festivals. and. Um, I went to the burn in 2011 and I was 18 and that's when I had the idea that psychedelics could be used for peace building and negotiating and uh, transitions, just like transitional justice processes. Thanks, Paula. Hi, everyone. My name is Ismail Lodido Ali. I'm very happy to be here. When I was 16, I ate mushrooms for the first time, quite a few years ago now. And I usually put that in the context of exactly where we were in history at that time. It's 2006, 2007 five-ish years after 9-11, a couple years into the invasion of Iraq. And as a young Colombian Pakistani first generation Muslim in Fresno, California, just about two hours north of here where I grew up, I started experiencing a lot of dissonance and disillusionment at a very young age seeing the country that my parents migrated to for the sake of their own survival to flee the conditions that they came from suddenly shift its direct aggressive oppressive anger not only toward more people outside of its borders but also to my community and the people that i surrounded myself by so after 9 11 i spent a lot of time in a deep depression, in a deep um, like state of angst. And I had an experience when I was 16, eating mushrooms for the first time and really recognizing how that disillusionment had shifted my relationship, not just with this religion, this faith, Islam, that I had practiced my whole life, but also my family, the people who taught it to me, my community, the people who had surrounded me and given me life for such a long time. And my first psychedelic experience at a relatively young age helped shift that deep um, anxiety and angst to something more like curiosity and wonder. And since then, I've gone on this path of exploring exactly what these incredible substances, plants, and molecules can do, and how exactly they interact with the world around us, in, in addition to how they interact with us as individuals. So over the course of the next few years, I studied a lot, I studied speech and language and thought and concepts. It took me to law school where I ended up focusing primarily on criminal legal reform as well. Human rights and criminal legal reform, really looking at mass incarceration, what we do to hold people accountable. We'll come back to this idea of accountability later, but what we do to hold people accountable and what it means to be accountable. And in 2016, I started working for MAPS, and I'm currently the Policy and Advocacy Council for MAPS, doing legal policy strategy, trying to figure out how to create legal, safe, intentional access to psychedelic substances in a variety of contexts, medical, personal, religious, transformational. So I'm definitely one of those people where the origin and the liberation kind of happened at the same time. And I'll get a little more into that, but I want to hear a little more from Roman. Just to be clear, I really 
really wanted this to happen. I'm so grateful I just have to name how grateful I am to be on stage with these two incredible beings. We literally flew Roman out from DC for three days. He has to go back on a red eye to DC tomorrow morning so he can be at the DOJ at 8, like 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So thank you for being here. Hey, I, I needed this, okay? <laughs> I needed this. Thank you all. Everyone who's danced with me on the dance floor, like, man, like, you guys, it, this feeds me. So thank you for praying for me with your dance moves and sending me your energy to bring back to DC. It's a hell of a crucible over there. Um, and I should just say, you know, the, the stage is kind of like synchronistic because I showed up on Thursday for Ismael's amazing talk, the Psychedelic State of the Union and, and the, the Psychedelic New Deal, whoever was there for that. Um, and I'm looking, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. We just, I, when he says he flew me from DC, we just finished up an event on the National Mall, which is the um, space of land that holds the Washington Monument, the Capitol Building, the Lincoln Memorial, and the White House. It's called the National Mall. The, well, the upper part's called the Mall, but most people call the whole part the Mall. We just finished up an event uh, in our fifth year called Catharsis on the Mall, yeah! which is um, basically a vigil for healing, including psychedelic healing on the National Mall. Uh, and really we're pioneering a, a space like this uh, where we have a porous and radically accessible link between our community and the tourists who are coming to the mall. You know, MAGA hats mi mixing with unicorn caps, okay? <laughs> so I think in a lot of ways that's the context for this talk for me. It's like, we're always asking what does it look like? Like how, do, how, does, how, how does psychedelics work into the default world? How, how does it all fit? Well, you know, we can get carried away with thinking about the answer, but what we've learned, I think, from festival culture is you create the right spaces and the answers emerge. So, um, and I learned that this artist's name who put these obelisks here, I think is Leland. I haven't met him yet, but this is super dope. I feel like in a slightly less um, imposing way, the, the DC catharsis vibe is here. These look like the Washington Monument. But anyway, um, so psychedelics were definitely not part of my origin story, okay? Um, <laughs> I didn't even really know what cannabis was until law school, okay? Um, and um, you know, my origin story is, has anyone heard of Pre uh, Trevor Noah's book uh, called Born a Crime? So I, was, I wasn't necessarily born a crime. Uh, we, thanks to Loving versus Virginia, uh, anti-miscegenation laws were ruled unconstitutional about 15 years before I was born, but I was certainly born a shame, okay? Uh, my, my, and I was born forbidden, uh, a forbidden product of a broken promise, uh, or a promise that was never, never made. So my, my father was, um, in his fifties, a uh, black man, uh, self-made man from Georgia originally, who moved his family up to Akron, Ohio, at the age of nineteen, with a sixth grade education, already one children and a sick mother, um, and he met my mother a white woman, born of German and Belgian immigrants, second generation, uh, farming people, uh, people who, who work the land. And that unlikely uh, meeting resulted in my existence. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and yet I was born to a colorblind, mainstream, fragile, um, unconscious, you know, white uh, family and white community. And I love my family very much. Anyone who knows me knows that the love I've received from my family is like, that, that's, that's the most important thing. And um, my liberation story comes in to reclaiming my own bloodline, my own bloodline, my own legacy, um, all parts of it, and healing those things that were, healing that intergenerational shame, um, and I dare say that, I think it's safe to say that psychedelics are a part of that liberation story, my liberation story. So, um, you know, 
another exercise if we can't, is it time for that? So y'all you you all are invited to this exercise too. Um, we're gonna ask you to turn to a neighbor or maybe form little micro circles to discuss your liberation story if you want. One, one, one cool way that, that I've found to do this is to think about who are your liberation mo role models? Sometimes we talk about the hero's journey. Sometimes we talk about historical or scriptural or spiritual figures. For me, one, I, I wrote down a number of figures, you know, Quaina Parker, Bob Marley, um, Fania Davis, if anyone knows her. These are all models for me. Um, but one of, but, but the, biblical, the biblical Exodus story, you know, um, I'm born into a white family that never acknowledged my blackness, not once. And just like Moses, you know, his, if, if you're from that tradition, he was uh, a son of Judea, right? And was not, that was not acknowledged. He was, he was privileged in the Pharaoh's house and then had to reclaim and um, in many ways heal his, his, his legacy, his lineage. Um, so that, that story always resonate, resonates with me, the Exodus story, and I think it probably resonates with a lot of folks in these times. So um, why don't we do that? If everyone wants to sort of put your arms out and look at, look at who's around you, we're going to take about five minutes and probably no more than four, groups of no more than four, and just trade what, what's significant about you as you craft your own liberation story? And who are your liberation heroes or your liberation models that you feel like archetypes even, that you are finding you're, you're inhabiting, sometimes not even by your own volition, right? So let's do that. Break into groups, have a few minutes, and share. Most importantly, listen. Oh. Stop recording.